I titled this morning's message, uh, Home. Just plain home. Uh, you might want to turn me down just a little bit more because I think I'm probably going to get louder. Um, there's a... Uh, <laughs> overheard a story of a young woman who said to a real estate agent why do I need a home I was born in a hospital educated in a college engaged in a car married in a hotel I lived out live out of a delicatessen and paper bags. I spend my mornings on the golf course, my afternoons at the bridge table, and my evenings at the movies. When I die, I'm going to be buried at the undertaker's. All I need is a garage. <laughs> Any of you who know me would know that I would have to give that some serious consideration. <laughs> All I need is a garage. Home. Um, that may be a humorous story, but that young lady uh, doesn't have a clue. She doesn't understand. Anybody who travels for work um, or even travels for pleasure uh, knows that no matter how good a time you had traveling, no matter how successful it was, no matter how interesting it was, uh, you know how good it feels when you come home, when it's, when it's done, when you, when you get back. What is, what is home? What's, uh, I, I'm not talking about a house. See, a house is just that. That's just a building. That's hopefully something that keeps the rain off your head and, and keeps you warm. That's a house, but a home. Some would say that home is where you hang your hat. Yeah. Yeah. It's way more than that. Um, others would say that home is where the heart is. Now that's getting pretty close to home. Home is where the heart is. So what, what do we do about a, a definition to some, somehow to understand such a simple word, a simple concept of home? Home is where you're accepted, um, where you're comfortable. Uh, you can be yourself. Uh, I don't know. For guys, home is where you can r walk around in your underwear. Um, the women, not so much. Home. Warm, comfortable. Belonging. You can be yourself. There's no place like home. And we do our best to, or at least I, I hope you do, we do our best to create our home environment here on earth. But just like everything else we do, we're sinful, fallen human beings. Which makes me think, if we can do a good job of it, and, and I surely hope that, that you do a good job of it. 
Um, I know in, in generations past and and even today um, we have an awful lot of people growing up without a home. A home you know, um, they may have uh, shelter, uh, they may have clothing, but um, they're lacking a home. But if, if the best that we can do as sinful people, I know somebody who can do it perfectly. And if he can, and I know that he will because he loves me. I think he loves you too. So when he makes a home, it'll be perfect. What would a perfect home feel like? I mean, when we... I, had to, I don't know about you, but when I settle in at home, Everything is okay. The rest of the world may be falling apart, imploding on its own, but home, home I'm safe. Some would say that a man's home is his castle. Another guy said, with interest rates rising, mortgage payments rising, cost of heating, fuel rising. <laughs> A man's home is his hassle. <laughs> no. Man's home doesn't matter what it is. It's where, it's where he's comfortable. Turn with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Um, and I only want to do the first three verses. John 14, 1. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to be with me that you also may be where I am. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Why do you suppose he said that? <laughs> it's always the same in the Bible. We don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, Paul would say. And Jesus here is saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. <laughs> it's because they were troubled. Their hearts were troubled. If you turn back into chapter 13 of John is where Jesus is explaining to them that he's leaving. Their hearts were troubled. He was doing everything he could to comfort them. To give them the information that they, that they needed to be the, the encouragement. It's not a command. It's an encouragement. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I had the thought of when I was preparing this message, I knew this was the passage I wanted to use, and it's so rich, there's so much in it, but I thought about just stopping there. Because 
I get the feeling that that's where we are today. Our hearts are troubled. There's, there are things going on and things on the horizon that we've never faced before that we have no idea what it's going to look like or how it's going to turn out. But Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Okay, Lord, I'm going to work on that. I'm going to not let my heart be troubled. But just like the disciples that were listening to him, I need to be encouraged, Lord. I need you to explain some things to me. Help me to understand and to, to see what's, what's out there. We've always wanted to know what's next, what's out there, what does the future hold. Um, there are people that make their living uh, as prognosticators of what does the future hold. These are the trends. This is what good work. But I don't think your work is liable. This is. This is. This is inaccurate. Okay, so we won't let our hearts be troubled. But here is our instructions. Trust in God. Okay, twofold. Going to leave the troubles over here. I'm going to trust in God. And I can evaluate how I'm doing with that by examining do these troubles bother me? Then I need to trust in God more. If I'm paying attention to the troubles, then I need to stop. And I'll trust in God. Pay more attention to Him. I'll spend more time, Lord, thinking about and researching and reading your word about how you love us, how you care for us, how life is going to go, how life is going to turn out. Are there going to be bumps in the road? Yep, they're over here, and I'm going to ignore them because I'm going to trust in God. Trust also in me. I got theologically I had a little trouble with that what do you mean trust in God trust also in you you are God help me Lord um, yeah Jesus was fully God he was walking the earth he was talking with human beings so he was demonstrating how he functions here on earth. He is still fully God, but he put his attributes aside. And if you're having trouble getting a handle on that, what, go to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Spend a little time there and let that sink in. So he's not denying his, uh, his position in the Godhead. Um, but he is telling them I'm here I'm with you trust in God trust also in me because I'm going to tell you about God I'm going to tell you about the future now I don't speak with the same authority that Jesus did but I want to tell you you can trust in me because I'm going to read it out of here and you can check on it. So trust in me as I tell you about our Savior.
about our Jesus and what he's what he said and it, this whole this whole little pass three verses and it is so beautiful I don't know if you recognized it or not in in verse 2 he says in my father's house are many rooms the King James says mansions. Right. Thank you, Ray. I <laughs> now I'm going to have to disappoint her because I think that's a wrong interpretation. That's a wrong uh, wording to use. And here's why. And I'm not saying that it's, it's wrong. I'm just saying it's not the best. Okay? How many of you want to live in a mansion or think that a mansion is the top of the heap? Not me. Okay? And the idea, if it's a mansion, it's mine i have one you have one the neighbor has one everybody has their own mansion and that misses the point of what he's saying in my father's house are many rooms this there's a, a little okay let me i'm gonna take just one minute here and, and give you just a quick little Greek lesson because that, because you don't need a Greek lesson but in this case that that word that's interpreted either mansions or rooms is uh, is only used one other place and that's over in verse 23 of this same chapter and in the King James it says abode and that actually is a really good use of the word that's a good um, English or American word that it, there is a difference between American and English the English people spell funny and they use funny terms and so it's American but it's an, an abode. And, and if, it's, if the same Greek word is interpreted or translated as abode in verse 23, it would be good to translate it as abode in, in this, in, in verse 2. Here's the reason. Here's my, here's my thinking on it. This, this whole thought, this whole passage has to do with the uh, Hebrew uh, vision or traditions of a wedding. A wedding, uh, a, theirs is a process. We have a wedding. They can walk up to, to, to the center aisle, you know, and say a few things, and they go away, and they're married. Not so for uh, the Hebrews. Not so for uh, Israelites. They have a they have a quite a process. Um, and if you've ever seen uh, the the movie Fiddler on the Roof, they did a very good job of of having that in in the movie. Here's the here's the difference. They would have a, a betrothal. Okay, we would we would look at it more like uh, it's a uh, an engagement. Um, there, in that culture, they would have uh, it would be more prearranged. Um, could be to the point of they've never met each other until that time and the families come together and say the two of you you're you're married um, you're going to create a home uh, for yourselves um, not not always but there is that formality of it and then the second part of it 
would be that the groom would go away. Um, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Um, I don't. I'm, I don't think that was uh, that was part of the the deal, but it works. Uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Um, for yearning, he's yearning for his new bride, for his wife, and and she gets to imagine and build in her thinking. What is married life going to be like? What are we going? going to do but when he goes away he goes away for a purpose he's going to his family home to build an addition onto it where they will live when they when they get together I was going to say when they get married but they're already considered married See, at that point, maybe you remember from the gospel story um, or the, the, the birth of Jesus and Joseph and Mary. Um, uh, they, he wished to put her away quietly um, because she was already pregnant. That was in that, that kind of a period of time. Uh, they were considered married. He goes away and he builds an addition on the family home where they will be able to, to be. And then he comes back. And he comes back for his bride. And when he comes back, there's a great celebration. That's, that, they're married already, but he comes back. He thinks maybe you recognize or remember the uh, parable about the young virgins, ten young virgins and their oil lamps, and five were foolish and five were wise and five had oil and five didn't have oil. That, that's the groom coming back. He came back in the middle of the night. He got done with what he was doing, what he was building, preparing for his new bride. And he comes back and they were watching. They were, it wasn't so much that they were virgins in the sense that we use it in our culture. Now, they were young girls. They were, they were just young women who would have been the attendants for the bride. Uh, and they were keeping watch because they were excited for the bride for this next step in their in their coming together so they're looking for him to come and he comes in the middle of the night because he didn't want to wait for dawn <laughs> which in itself has got to kind of make you smile um, he's anxious <laughs> He wants to be there. He wants his new bride. So when he comes, they get uh, together. They have this great feast. They have a good time. The families say goodbye because that's exactly what they're to do. If you remember back in Genesis chapter 2, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife or cleave to his wife and that's the picture here in in this wedding ceremony this is they are leaving their families and he is taking his bride to a place he's already prepared for her where she can in our culture she can create her nest um, it can be hers it's home. In my father's house are many rooms. Many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you.
I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and has he gone? Yeah. Yeah. A couple thousand years ago. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Now does that fit into what he's saying? I, I know I've told you from, from the pulpit and God has told you a, a number of times as you read through scripture his deep, deep love for his children, for us, for you. And if I go, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, when you die, is it, is it any wonder why people without the Lord, when they die or when they look at death, there's nothing there but a black hole for them. They have no idea. There's nothing. They just, life is just over for them. For us, that's not, that's not true. We have, we have a very specific plan in, laid in action for us. It's already laid out. This is what's going to happen. I'm going away and I'm going to build a place in my father's house there are many rooms and since I do everything perfectly that room that you're going to have is going to look like a mansion can I redeem myself it's going to be perfect going to be just exactly what we need and what are we going to need when we leave this earth and we go home to heaven we're going to need to feel wanted secure protected provided for and Dare I say comfortable? Comfortable. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I will come back and take you to be with me. I will come back and take you to be with me. That's the rapture. That's the rapture. That's, that's the, the wedding scene. That's the, the ten virgins that are keeping watch waiting for him to come in the middle of the night. I'm getting sleepy. Oh, I can't stay awake, but I know he's coming. Boy, isn't that where we're at? I'm, a bit too, I'm getting tired. But I know he's coming back. And I want to keep watch. I want to I don't want to miss a minute when he comes back. 
when he comes for his church and the dead in, rise, dead in Christ rise from the grave, how, how many people, when that happens, are going to be, ah! <laughs> And how many of us are going to be just, ah, now! It's now! I hope your life here is exciting. But just imagine it can't possibly be as exciting as that. Can't possibly. Stand there and look around if it happens while I'm alive and I'm hoping and pretty sure it's gonna, gonna look around and see that happening. Boy, I hope I'm not so distracted that I forget to look up. Got another verse for you, though. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. You see, because there's in this in this whole wedding process remember that there's the betrothal or the time where they come together and then he goes away and then he comes back to get her and then they go to be married and and establish their own home well in the middle of that or when he comes back for her there's another event that happens and i've kind of alluded to it a little bit in in their wedding ceremony their wedding process in revelation 19 gives us insight to another one of those little elements that happens in there and this is, uh, and this is the, the, I don't, I'm, I'm doing my best to try to not confuse you. But if now people, uh, when, when the rapture happens, we will go to heaven, we will go to be with the Lord. Okay. It's, it's, in, in time or in the progression or in the chronology of this or anything, that's an intermediate heaven. There's another step, and that's the final step, a new heaven and a new earth. If you're familiar with your, your Bible, with the uh, book of Revelation, the new heaven and the new earth and the old will pass away. The old earth and the old heaven will pass away, and uh, and theologians are arguing even to this day over whether it's actually new or it's recreated or it's just polished up and shined or what it, is. it doesn't matter. Scripture says there's a new heaven and a new earth, and I'll let God decide what that's going to be. Um, don't you think that's generous on my part? Revelation 19, verse 6. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb... Noted, pick up on that, the wedding of the Lamb. The lamb who's the Lamb? Jesus is the Lamb. The, the Lamb that was slain for us. Who's the bride? The church, us. We're, we're, let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. 
fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. The wedding supper of the Lamb. The betrothal, he goes away, makes a place for his new bride. He comes back for her, and they have this great feast. That's what's happening here. That's that great feast that we are invited to because we are part of it. The wedding supper of the Lamb. Our groom has come for us. And far more than the groom, but what, what is a groom supposed to be? What's the husband supposed to, to be? And do you realize that here pretty shortly it's already becoming illegal to refer to husband and wife and male and female and they're doing everything they can to not only stifle us, but stamp out any reference to God. Our groom has come for us. Are you ready for that? Yeah. One more. One more and then I'll quit. No, I probably won't quit, but I'll stop for now. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3. I'll give you a minute to get there. Because if what we're looking forward to, not just, I hope you are looking forward to it, not just the direction but reach out to grab it. Grab a hold of it. Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 um, through 20. Um, Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have told, often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Well, then Russ, what are you doing? I mean, you painted this beautiful scene of what lies ahead for us, and now where are you going? Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. And then verse 20, But our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. This verse, just these couple of verses here out of Philippians just paints a, with a broad brush a picture of where we are today and what this world is, is like and what's happening and, and it's getting worse and so on. And the shining light in the midst of all of that is the church, is us. It's you. Our citizenship is not here. We don't belong here. No wonder you feel like a stranger. No wonder you feel like you're out of step with what's going on. Because you are. Our citizenship is in heaven. 
We're ambassadors at some foreign post called Earth. And we need to be as ambassadors, we need to be in this present time. We need to be the connection between the world and heaven. And to be that connection and to draw people to it, to have them know, means we need to live like it. And one of the things that will, will continue to be as the world gets darker and darker and darker around us, the light is going to get brighter and brighter and brighter. Who's the light? I used to have a, a car uh, made by Oldsmobile that, that uh, had, if you looked in the rear view mirror, mounted inside the car was a set of little lights that you could see in your rear view mirror. Um, and they, they were indicators as to your brake lights and tail lights, if they were working, this little light shone in your rear view mirror. So every time you looked in your rear view mirror, you would know if your brake lights were working or whatever. Yeah, and, and they, were, they were just little, little tubes that carried the light from the brake light up to this little indicator in our rear view mirror. Every once in a while, you need to check your rear view mirror and make sure that your light still shines. Because there's always people watching. Always people watching, and usually they're watching from behind us. Hmm. So, how's your light doing? at this point and how when you quit looking in your rear view mirror and you look out the front are you excited about what you see out there what lies ahead I don't know about you but I am I am um, <laughs> We, we go through life as believers, as, as Christians. We have his word. We carry it with us. Um, hopefully you don't let it get dusty. You open it up. You read it. You read the promises of God. You read those things that he wants us to know. And, we, and we, we, it shapes and molds our lives that there. But I'll tell you what, I don't think there's anything that is shaping and molding my life any more directly and impacting it than the idea of heaven. When, uh, first of all, I want to go there. But when I get there, I want to have something for my Savior. I want to take something with me. Um, there used to be a Christian community, a community comedian that, that said when he was waiting for the rapture, uh, he said when it happens, he's going to reach out with each hand and grab a hold of a non-believer and, 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 and then ask him, okay, now what as they're going up? <laughs> I thought that was the funniest thing in the world. What a sight. Boy, I'd like to do that, though. I hadn't. But even more than that before then, how about grabbing hold of one or two of them 
and say, you know what? <laughs> As it gets darker and darker around you, I'm looking more and more forward to my Savior's face. I want to see him face to face because I have a place that looks like a mansion <laughs> waiting for me. I don't know if it's a room or an apartment building or a condominium. I, you, can, you can put whatever label you want on it. It, what? Yeah. But it's going to be perfect because my Savior who loves me created it and made it for me and wants absolutely the very best for me has, has made it in a place where there's no more sin and there's no more tears and there's no more crying. Thank you. Is there anybody else got one? An amen? Yeah. Uh-oh. I'm going to stop. Only because I should, not because I want to. Next week, one more on heaven. One more. You'll have to come back then. Let's pray. Lord, um... <coughs> Lord, if there's a proper position for prayer, that we're in it. We want it. I've hands out, head up, head bowed, laid down, prostrate. Doesn't matter, Lord. Uh, we recognize your great love for us, your care, um, how you love your children. Uh, to the point of providing not, not only today and tomorrow, but for all eternity, a place, a home, a place where we're loved and cared for, where there's compassion, a place where there is celebration and joy. Lord, what could be greater? Lord, we want to spend time, spend our days watching, watching for your return, watching for your coming, for your family, for your bride. Lord, we love you. Not because of all of those things that you have done and provided for us. Not because you have given to us. But because you loved us first. So Lord, as time unfolds here on earth, we look forward to what you have in the future. We use our best understanding to know what it is you have. And I know, Lord, that it will be greater than our imagination. It will be greater than what we can, what we can think of. Watch over us, Lord. Help us to keep a check on our light to make sure it's shining for others that when that time comes there will be more population in heaven than even there is today thank you in Jesus name we pray amen